Coming up, Artist Rewind welcomes Rudy Sarzo right here to the broadcast. And uh, Rudy, welcome to the show. Great to be back. How are you doing? Yeah. Or am, is this the same show? Because we've done a show before. <laughs> is this the same show or a different show? You know, Rudy, I am so out of my mind. It's the same <laughs> show with the same uh, host, except it's a little more. When we first got together, it was like a marathon. It was like we were on for eight hours. I'm surprised yes. you even came back. Now it's structured, and and I have a format which I try to stick to. But sometimes mm -hmm. I get you know my attention span's a little all out of the place. Yeah, so you, got, you got to forgive me on that. But yeah, it was a year. It was about a year ago that you were on the show when I first started the show. Correct. Oh, that's a lot of different yeah. versions of me. <laughs> that's, 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 bam! Welcome to Artist Rewind, your ultimate intimate conversation with your favorite artist. Also, please check us out on Patreon. If you want to get unedited, unlocked episodes, join our VIP All Access Backstage Pass. That'll allow you to see more content, more shows, and also you will be eligible to play in our Vinyl Showdown. First Saturday of every month, we do a Vinyl Showdown where you actually will come on and play, show your vinyl records, and walk away with records sponsored from us. All right. Coming up in the hot seat tonight, you might know him from Whitesnake, Ozzy Osbourne. Well, he's back with his old band, Quiet Riot. We have Rudy Sarzo in the hot seat tonight. And that's all coming up next. We're going to see what he's been up to, what he's going to be doing. And he's going to talk about some rock and roll tales with you and I. Are you ready? All right. Ready? Roll it. Bam. <laughs> Big news that you're back in Quiet Ride on um, this iconic record. To me, this was, mm -hmm. I'm going to tell you, Rudy, this was like a Meet the Beatles album for me. Um, I would wow. stare at this, al yeah, I would stare at this album cover and the jacket, the hair, everything, the coolness of this band and the album cover. If you look, look at the artwork, the little buttons that they that, that he's wearing of the band in there. Mm -hmm. It just was a fantastic album cover, the design and everything. And then going down the rabbit hole, I didn't mm -hmm. know the history after becoming a fan and uh, of the yeah. band. But you have quite a, of a history. In the beginning of Quite Right, it was like 77, is it when you first encountered Kevin and, and the guys? Uh, was well, it I, I first met them, and it was a meeting like I had a, a, about, I would say, five years prior. With yeah. Frankie Benelli in 1972, I uh, I basically I I watched his band opening up for David Bowie, and during the Ziggy Stardust tour. Wow! And then following day on my birthday, November 18, 1972, I'm at this club in Fort Lauderdale, and I'm talking to somebody, and she goes, "Oh, that's one of the guys from the band that opened up for Bowie last night." So I. I was so impressed with Frankie's playing during the show that I kept telling the person that I was with how great the band was, and especially the drummer, which is incredible. So I run over to this guy and I start, you know, raving about the show and their drummer. And he goes, oh, I'm Frankie. I'm the drummer. <laughs> and so, so we met that night and we started our our partnership i mean i played with frankie from that point on until we i i along with my brother until my brother and i we left and we traveled up to up north getting away from disco in, in yeah, Florida. yeah. Uh, and it wasn't as much as disco it was the the disco co consciousness and musically it's like a lot of the guys that that I was playing with in, in bands locally, they were just satisfied with that, you know, being in a club band and just making really, you know, good money actually, and and having the cars and the drugs and the chicks. And, and me, I was like, no, no, no. I want to be a recording artist. I want to be in a band. I don't want to be a top 40 musician. So my brother and I, we just left. And then um, Frankie, um, I, I started playing the mid, uh, Midwest circuit and then Frankie joined us when we were looking, you know, when we we're looking to, for, for, for a drummer, you know, I call up Frankie and say, Hey, you know, you want to come up here to Chicago and blah, blah, blah. And he goes, yeah. So, you know, so we're playing together again. Then about three, three of us from that band decided to like, as a matter of fact, one, it was Frankie Benelli and Bob Marlette, who is a very uh, successful producer, yeah. you know, well, he was our keyboard player. And so we go and Bob Marlette's, 
station where family station wagon with a huge u-haul we just travel over you know over to la and we um, and and frankie bob and and i became roommates along with with another member of the band and uh, so so my my trajectory and then meeting kevin at the starwood after watching choir riot perform you know i was really super impressed i'm going like wow these guys they're doing an arena show in a club so wow. they they have a vision they're going to go somewhere you know and especially the attraction of having randy rhodes performing he already had a fan club you know and and you knew there were fans because randy used to wear polka dots vest and a, and a polka dot uh, bow tie and all the girls in front of him were dressed just like him <laughs> they were really the, yeah yeah so i said oh there's something going on in here It's, it's, it's a very simple formula. If you have, if you can attract people locally, you can attract them globally because we're all connected. We're looking for the same thing. If, if you're a fan of a band, it's because they got something that you want. Mm -hmm. And it's a very simple equation. You know, what is it that you want? When it, usually what we want is what everybody else wants, you yeah. know? Yeah. So it's like, okay, you do the math. So, say, so these guys have this massive fan club here and it's because they're giving the people something that they want or they need or whatever, you know. And so that can multiply globally. You know, it's, it's consciousness is so, it's like, for example, the Stones, when they do a stadium tour, it's not just one stadium tour or, or, or it's one stadium show in one city. No, it's because they have that sizable following globally. So they can go around the world and play stadiums because it's, it's the formula. Same thing with Guns N' Roses. See, I went to this a band from the 60s. I can give you a band that is current. And, and if they have the same impact, you too. They do stadium tours because mm -hmm. sometimes they'll do smaller ones because they decide to go intimate, but it's not because they have to scale down because the, of their popularity. No, they're popular globally. Bruce Springsteen, all of these Metallica, all of these artists, they have tapped into the global consciousness. And it's a formula that equates to globally, not just locally. So well, I, I, saw, I, I yeah. felt it when I, like I said, I felt it when I saw you guys, I'm like, oh my God, this is, you know, you guys really cracked open the, the, the scene for LA to, for me, for a kid from Brooklyn. You know, you, you know, and, and there's, there's, there's always something behind that, right? Behind every successful thing, there's, mm -hmm. there's something that starts boy before. Uh, the biggest anthem that the band wrote, uh, Metal Health. <laughs> Right. Okay. That has its seed in the fact that Randy left Quiet Riot in 79, went over to join Ozzy and was exposed. And also Randy was exposed to the, the new wave of British metal. That if you were in LA in 1980 or 81, when I joined Ozzy 40 years ago, you were not aware of what was to come that was already busting, bursting at, in the local England and European metal scene, music scene. It wasn't even mm -hmm. considered metal. I mean, you know, Judas Priest, uh, Motorhead, Def Leppard, Iron Maiden. It wasn't just, uh, well, these guys are metal. No, these guys are rock. This is the new rock, right? Because it, it everything goes in cycles. So we went from like, Let's say in Los Angeles, we went from like uh, Ben Halen being the last rock band to be signed locally, you mm -hmm. know, or, or pretty much in the United States, yeah. you know, yeah. And because after that, New Wave and, and Punk came in. So Ben Halen was like the last one, right? Okay, so here's, here's Randy in LA going like, uh, you know, you know, we, we were trying, we were trying, but the, but the record companies just didn't care. Not just about us, but just about every other band that came out of the Sunset Strip in the 80s. There was a, there was a version of Motley Crue at the time. There was Mickey Rat, which turned into Rat. You had Dokken. 
you had Gray White, there was called something else, you have Blackie Lawless, you know, trying to do his thing. So, it, you know, it was basically all of us were in the same boat. We were not getting the record company's attention. As a matter of fact, a, a lot of the bands decided to create their own label, just like Motley Crue did the first record uh, the, on their own label. Leather Records, correct? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Rat, Rat, or yeah, Rat did, did the same thing. So it, it it, it, that became the norm, you know, if, if the record companies are not going to pay attention to us, then we're going to make records and give it to our fans, you know, and just just to stay alive. It was a matter of survival. It wasn't even a great marketing tool. And it was like, we need to make some money so we can pay the rent and pay for a rehearsal. Let's make some records. We'll find somebody to invest money. They'll get payback and then we get the rest because we own the masters, you know, things like that. And um, so here you have Randy has to leave L.A. in 1979 to go join Ozzy. Joking, because Shannon always jokes with me anyway. And she called me one day and told me, and uh, I just didn't believe it. I, for a week, still, I didn't believe it, you know, because I'm, I'm really proud and honored, and I don't want to stop here, you know. And then all of a sudden, it's like he realizes, oh, my, there is a scene. There's, 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 there's a future in this and what I'm doing, right? Plus the fact that now Randy is free to play really what Randy is all about, not just what the record companies want from you, telling you, well, if you come back with the demo that sounds like this record that's in the chart, we'll come and see you guys play locally. <laughs> you know, yeah. Otherwise, they, they weren't even going to bother, right? So here's Randy now all of a sudden like, okay, I'm making a record. I'm going to make this music. And he asked, he actually asked Ozzy, what do you want me to write? And Ozzy says, be yourself, which meant now Randy is going deep into his classical musical roots. Or like on the first record, there's a lot of those riffs were actually quiet riot like riffs. Yeah. We're gonna do a song now that I'm gonna be a little modest, features one of the ace guitar players in the United States. Although everyone except for all of you here don't know it yet. <laughs> Randy Rose! you know wow. you know parts you know uh, parts of songs and so on right and so we so randy starts playing in in england and um, they, i i joined the band at some point you actually had two guys from choir riot in Ozzy's band you had two guys from choir riot one from black seven and one from black oak arkansas you know which is um, Tommy Aldrich playing drums with us. Okay, so there was a certain LA Quiet Riot consciousness in that band. Of course, the record was recorded, you know, with Lee Curtis Lake and Bob Daisley. It's a whole yeah. different consciousness. Mm -hmm. But Randy kept that. And when he went on stage, even though I got my 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 mentoring on what British metal is all about from Sharon, because I had no reference of what what because i hadn't been to england yet i had joined the band but it was just we were playing you know, locally i mean domestically in the mm -hmm. united states mm -hmm. you know i was in i hadn't played in in the you know outside of the united states yet with ozzy so my reference of what to do on stage was what i did on the sunset strip with quiet riot and very quickly i got a mentoring from sharon of what i what not to do <laughs> she had a strong vision of what she oh absolutely she yeah. had to she hmm. had to because uh, the family had made a huge investment and when i say the family the arden family because uh, you know sharon's dad who mm -hmm. was the manager and um, she would oversee the operations on a daily basis because she was traveling with us and she she was calling all the shots on the road it wasn't like texting her dad because we're, it's 40 years old, ago so she couldn't be on the phone all, all mm -hmm. the time asking her her dad what to do she had to make a lot of decisions right there at that you know right 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 in the moment you know it had to be made and she, she called the shots and she had the vision she knew what she had to do she at first she had to appeal to the core the fan base the core black sabbath fan base okay ozzy's got this band which is as heavy as Black Sabbath. You know, you have to like sell this whole, all, all this idea. I'm not saying that we were, but this is this is the marketing. Okay, Ozzy, still heavy. Check these guys out. Check this guitar player out. Check the records out, right? And 
with that comes the image. And here I am, I'm kind of like, oh no. I did get a quick glimpse of what metal was really all about when, when Motorhead, when I first saw Motorhead, it was like, whoa, these guys are serious. There's a consciousness. The crew and the band, it's almost like they're wearing a uniform. They all wear denim, denim jackets, denim pants, or in Lemmy's case, well, this was the summer tour, he was wearing denim shorts. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, it's almost like took but, the skinny tie image from the Beatles and then they had their uniform, like the Ramones had theirs. Everybody, it's, yeah. it's a consciousness. It's really a consciousness, you know, because they're, you're all in this together. This, this one reason, purpose why we are here on the road is, is to be, like you said, the Ramones or Motorhead, and in this case, uh, this is what Sharon wanted. But since Ozzy was a solo artist, you focus that consciousness on the individual. Even though, you know, the fans could not help but watching Randy play and saying, wow, you know, this guy is as much part of Ozzy's consciousness as, as Ozzy himself. Mm -hmm. You know, he's, he's a... He's a uh, He's instrumental in putting that across and actually being part of that, of what Ozzy is, even today. You know, if somebody says, Ozzy, oh yeah, Crazy Train, that's a 40-something 40, 40 old year old song. And Ozzy's had like 20, at least 20 albums after that. But yeah. that's that's what you go it's into. An, it's yeah. Ozzy's anthem. It's, it's his, Ozzy's that, anthem. It's his yeah. anthem. It's really interesting because his anthem used to be Paranoid. That was the last song that we played. After, you know, you could not put Paranoid like in the middle of the show and no. then continue. Elvis has left the stage. Totally. You know, Elvis so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Okay. So, uh, so, so here we are on tour. And, and every time we used to come back to L.A. from the road, we used to go directly, Randy and I, from the airport, to Kevin's place and then take him out and we'll go to the rainbow and give him an update of what's going on. Because here's Kevin. Yeah, I mean, I was living with Kevin. I was playing in his band with bro right after I joined Ozzy. So it was like, we had this, we were tight, you know? And, and I supported Kevin's vision of what he was doing with Dubro. You know, I'll play with him, you know? And, and, and so we would come back and say, hey, Kev, you, you can't believe what's going on out there, man. There's all these bands and we tour with Duff Leppard and, Motorhead, and we, wow. we were on tour with Saxon in Europe, and there's this band called Girl that we were on tour with, and so there's like this, you know, it's like, you know, what you're doing, what you've been doing, what Quiet Riot used to be, it's, it's kind of like returning, so don't give up. Oh, by the way, there's these guys that stand on front of the stage, and they bang their heads against the stage, man. And it's like, I mean, these guys are devoted. They're like out of their minds. So he got that idea of <coughs> bang your head from us telling him about these guys that really existed. It was not right. like made up. Be before really metalheads, before it was in the States here, before it was those metalheads banging oh, their yeah. heads, it was stuck. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. Wild. Yeah. So originally the song Metal Health was, was called No More Booze. That Carlos and Tony Cavazzo, who have writing credit, of course, on, on that song, <coughs> they used to play that in their band Snow. So when, when Carlos came in to what well, was Dubro at the time, mm -hmm. he brought in Don't Wanna Let You Go, which is one of his songs. I mean, if you like, you, you put up the album credit, uh, the album cover, the back of mm -hmm. it, all the credits are there. Chuck mm -hmm. Wright, before, before I even went in to play on Thunderbird, he recorded uh, Metal Health. And and don't want to let you go because he was playing in Dubro at the time. Wow, you know. Wow. So so when I came in to actually just playing one song, Thunderbird. I mean, but that's that's the whole story. But but we were talking about what what your experience of actually hearing what was what we in Quiet Riot we term as the Quiet Riot written anthem because the other one is Come and Feel the Noise and that's basically a cover. Of a uh, of a Slate song. You know that the producer wanted wanted the uh, the band to uh, which to record. which you guys made it your own. <laughs> you, you turned it really into your own version. Yeah, if you don't have a reference 
like I did. I had no reference. I had never heard that song. I had no idea. When I went to record that as an overdub, because I, uh, when I went in to record Thunderbird, I was still a member of Ozzy. As a matter of fact, a few days later, I, I left to record the Speak of the Devil album, you know, the Black Sabbath re-recordings at the Ritz with Brad Gillis and Tommy and, of course, Ozzy. And uh, all my equipment was on the road. So I brought my practice bass, which was a Roland synthesizer, which I thought, oh, this is going to sound pretty good on the Thunderbird because I, I gave it more of a uh, ballad melodic tone to the synthesizer itself. And then when, when I, I wasn't really prepared for the fact that they, they started asking me after we tracked Thunderbird and we did a couple of passes and the producer goes, hey, do you remember any of the old songs? Because they had a lot of time left. We, we just didn't know how long it was going to take to do this, but we did it really quickly because I already knew the song from being in Dubro and playing, and playing that song and coming up with the bass part before I joined Ozzy when I was playing in Dubro. Okay, it's because at, at, at this moment, Quiet Riot, the Metal Health version, as Quiet Riot did not exist, there was being recorded as Dubro and with a possible, they were basically demos. Yeah. Because there was no record deal. The band was not signed. There was basically, let's make some songs. And as a production company, which was Pasha, let's go and, and, and the producer's job was to take those songs to different labels to see which label wanted to distribute it. And that mm -hmm. became the, uh, the Metal Health record. So, uh, so I, 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 I tracked uh, Select Black Cadillac with that bass. I bypassed the, uh, the synthesizer module and I just went straight into, into the bass, uh, uh, into the pickup that, that it has. And that's what you hear. And then after that, we did a couple more songs that we used to do in Dubro. Then as I'm leaving, I see Tony Cavasso, who is Carlos's brother, coming in to track uh, Come and Feel the Noise. And that's when, you know, I, I overheard Frankie and Kevin talking about sabotaging the song because they really did not want that song on, on what if there was going to be a record, they didn't want that song on that record. <laughs> wow, interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Frankie promised Kevin, oh, I'm going to play it as bad as I can. So, so the producer will give up on it. And that's actually one take. That's Frankie because I'm, I watched the whole thing. So I can tell you. I one take so, so that track on on that record is one take huh one take one take that that's frankie doing what he he refers to at his uh you know uh back in the day i don't know if they still have they have the list like wind up monkey playing mm. playing drums so it's like very simple to him but to him so that's frankie's own version of like i'm gonna be the wind up monkey which was a popular toy back then, you know. Yeah, I remember 40, it very well. 40, 40, 40 <laughs> some years ago, you know. So that's him going to bat, to, to bat. And actually, it works because it just totally makes works. it more hypnotic. You know, it's not a whole lot of stuff going on, you know, very solid. You know, so uh, I watched the whole thing and I thought, I, I knew Frankie could not play bad because I had been playing with him for such a long time and I knew this is an impossibility. I want to see what, how, how he pulls this off, you know? <laughs> and as I, as I, as I thought, he, he was like, yeah, it's a take. Okay, we're done. Yeah. And Kevin was fuming about that. I mean, yes, if, if you actually want to hear the story that I'm telling you in Frankie's own words, just go to, to Spotify, Monsters of Rock and go to the Frankie Benelli interview that I did with him on the show. And it, that and many, so many other stories. I mean, some, some really crazy stuff. And it, it's going to give you a pretty clear picture of how things were 45 years ago, 40 years ago, you know, in, in, in the music industry in Los Angeles, because they're little time capsules. Uh, you know, I mean, the younger audience might not even believe it because it was so different from what's going on today. It was such a different time. Were you living with Kevin at the same time while you were playing with? No, Ozzy? no, no, no. Okay. No. I, the day that that I have, I was admitted into the band. <laughs> yeah. I passed the audition. I immediately started living with, uh, at Sharon's uh, family home, a uh, huge state up in the hills. I went from sleeping on the floor on a sheet, not wow. even a mattress, to to living up in the uh, in a mansion built by Howard Hughes for one of his girlfriends. Was it uh, was it Howard Hughes's mansion? Was it really? 
Well, That's he pretty- he bought it. He paid for it. Wow. But but I I I believe it was Jane Russell. Jane wow. Russell. Wow. Yeah, that was that that was that was her home. I'm talking about uh, the um, uh, the living room area was like a courtyard with a with a with a roof, and you could press a button, and the roof will you know go back, wow. and you see the stars. You know, it was that that type of a paradise. That's pretty high tech for a home that old. Yeah. Do you think about? It? Did you call your family back home? Hey, look where I'm living now. You you know tell your family and what's going on. Well, yeah, yeah, but you know. We're talking forty years ago, long distance calls. I couldn't even. I just joined the band. I, yeah, it wasn't yeah. like I. I we, we would designate an hour and a and a, and, a, and a date, which would be like on the weekend. So my dad would be home from work. So I I would all get on the phone and talk. Uh, there's no texting. There's no FaceTime. There's no none, none of that. It was more like if if you make if you choose chose to make a phone call to somebody it's because. You really love them. <laughs> That's true. That's very yeah. true. Very yeah. true. Yeah. Very true. What what an incredible experience, man. Yeah. So now, so now, yeah. so then, so when you got back with Quiet Riot, when you were doing the, you weren't, were you back full in the band when you were doing Thunderbird or you were just in and out? No, um, I was still, a, I was still a member, a member of, of Ozzy okay. at the time. Okay. Uh, but this, this, this is what happened, you know, look. You know, Quiet Riot to me is 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 one one thousand percent whatever however you want to break it. Let's say one hundred percent, just traditional, one hundred percent me. It's me. It's me. When I when when I joined the band in nineteen seventy eight, I found well, it, it was very simple. I had actually seen watch a band and that I said they got it together before I joined them. I ran into Kevin. At the club, you know, he gets off the stage, and I go, "Man, you know, my name is Rudy, and I just saw you guys, and you know, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. You're gonna get signed because you, you are on the right track." And that's how we met, just like with Frankie about five years before. I met him, and I told him the same thing about you know how great the drummer was. Well, I told Kevin how great the band is, not thinking that I'm gonna join the band or anything like that. No, yeah. I was doing something else. But I was like, "Hey, you guys are great." And then I was out of town within a week from going back to LA because I had to go get, you know, make some money playing top 40 and come back and give it another shot. And I get the call from Kevin saying, Hey, you know, everybody says we have, we're looking for a bass player. Everybody says that you're the guy because they were looking for somebody who could play with their fingers. Hmm. That's the, t- the, the feel that they were the tone, going yeah, after. The t- tone, the tone, yeah. 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 And most of the guys in LA at the time that were available were playing with picks. Okay. So, as people kept saying, yeah, check out Rudy. He's the one you're looking for. And it just so happens that I was going back to LA and I go, Hey, I'll be there next week. I'll give you a call. soon as I get back, get it, get to LA and I'll come down on audition. I did. I got the gig. Right. So here I am for the very first time in a band that has everything I'm looking for, has everything I want, which is not great players, great songs. And they are solely looking for a record deal. They're not a top 40 band. Hmm. You know, they have a following, they got their image, they have the vision. I saw them, you know, by then about a year before, and I go, these guys are going to make it. Now I'm in the band that I believe of all the bands that I've seen in town, they're going to make it, right? So I got that. We're all same, you know, collective consciousness. It was all about Quiet Riot. I wasn't thinking about political issues. I didn't even know. I wouldn't even know to this day what party any of the guys in the band were. Yeah. Because yeah. we didn't care. We didn't talk about politics. We didn't argue about anything. It was all about the music, religion. Love for rock and roll. It was a love yeah, for religion. rock and roll. We mm-hmm. never talked about religion. I have my religious beliefs, but it wasn't mm-hmm. something that I felt I must tell these guys, yeah. you know, about it. No, it was all about the music. That's what we're there for, right? So I'm in. I'm, I'm playing with Ozzy, and here I am again. I'm playing with somebody, a member of. Of the band that we had a collective collective vision so even though you know if you listen especially to to blizzard of Oz, there's a lot of coming from randy there's a lot of quiet riot consciousness the pop sensibility that it, you know songs like no bone movies no like you know that those were typical you know the type of songs that he would write with quiet riot 
Of yeah. course, when you put Ozzy on top of that, it's going to sound completely, it was going to sound like Ozzy because Ozzy can make happy birthday sound like Ozzy. That's <laughs> right. you, he has you know? a, you know, right away when you hear Ozzy, you just know right away. Ozzy is song. Ozzy. Or, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So, 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 you know, Randy dies and I lost, I lost that, that, that part of my, my, our mutual consciousness that we had, mm. it was gone. You know, Ozzy comes from a different place. Uh, he invented the, you know, his band Black Sabbath invented that place where Ozzy comes from. He's the inventor. There wasn't, it did not exist before they did it. So, but that wasn't part of, of my consciousness. I guess it's because I grew up in Miami and I had more of a sunny, bright consciousness, you know, living in a, in a sunny place. And then I moved to LA again. It's the same consciousness. So what, what Randy, what, yeah, what a hard thing. I mean, here you are you, you, friends with Randy more than anything. And you're in the band pre and then afterwards he passed away mm -hmm. and you're on tour with him when that happened. Correct. Yeah. When Rich, yeah. And that's wow. Mentally. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I have a book off the rails that details, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for anybody who's interested out there, they can find it on Amazon, Kindle or print or whatever. But uh, by going back to, to, to what happened is, so, you know, I my life was, our lives were never the same. But my reason was being that I lost that familiar, that family feel. Mm -hmm. Because I love Tommy and we spent a lot of time playing together, but he came from a different place consciousness wise you know and i mean and we're really good when we get together and we play but it's it's a different place and and ozzy from another different place than myself and but randy and i we had that consciousness in common so i come in to read to do thunderbird to play on thunderbird and all of a sudden i'm in the same room with frankie who i have met and started playing with 10 years before Mm -hmm. And he mentored me in how to find the consciousness that I was looking for. Because prior for me to be playing with, with Frankie, I was basically in the Latin, in the Cuban rock uh, culture, which was not necessarily British rock, which is what I was looking for. I was looking at, on a way how to connect more with that than, than the more of the Latin flavored rock that was, that was being performed in Miami. So I had to go to Fort Lauderdale every day after I met Frankie and play with him so I could be mentored in how to play like that, how to think like that. You know, I knew what my taste was, but I just needed to find a place where I need, needed to be educated about it. You know, and Frankie was my mentor in that. So here I'm playing with him again, somebody that is part of, he saw, he's, He's such a part of my own consciousness that it was like, great, I'm playing with Frankie. I, you know, sometimes you play with people that you, you, you just don't, you just know how they're going to play. You were home. You felt yeah, home. I'm, I'm home. I'm home, right? He's the guy who taught me that there is a rhythm section consciousness. And this is how you do it. This is what you have to listen to. So I am home. You're correct. And then Kevin, who I, I was playing with him right before Ozzy. And, and he's the singer and songwriter in this co collective consciousness called Quiet Riot that I was in with him and in Dubrow. So I am home when, when I went in to do Thunderbird. Now, if I, if I would have just done one song, it might have been different. The fact that I stayed there for about three or four hours tracking four songs at least, it was like I got to spend time and it's like, oh, Wait a minute. This feels this feel like it felt before Randy passed away. So Quiet Riot had something that I lost when Randy died. It was home, you know? And we human beings, once we lose something that we love or that we need that fulfills our life, we spend the rest of our lives looking for it again. I might have never found it. The certain things that I've lost musically that I have not found again with other people, all their musicians, bandmates, 
But this I found. I got, I found home again once I went in to do the session. Wow. And I had to make the decision. And it, basically, it was a no-brainer. Because me not being home, I was, I, it's, I was not the musician that I wanted to be. I could not perform the way that I wanted to perform. Mm. I lost that. I lost that consciousness of being free to be myself on stage or, or have a certain frequency to perform with, you know, being in tune to something that it was collective. And I had to make a decision of leaving one of the biggest bands in the world for the complete unknown that was Quiet Riot. The only thing that I knew that I was certain about was that I was home. What that meant, or, the, or there was no guarantees that this home was going to be successful. All I knew is, is that I, I was going to find the joy of playing or making music again. And ever since Quiet Riot, even with the Randy Rhodes era, or even with the Metal Health era, and us reuniting again in the 90s, it was always about being home. And my decision, in addition to being Frankie's request, that I that I returned to the band was a decision that I had to meditate on it because it is that important, you know, not meditate whether it was the right decision to make or or not. No, that wasn't the point. It was to meditate about the timing of it mm. because it could not be an abrupt abrupt decision that. You drop everything you're doing and, and you change the band. Well, Regina and I, we sat and we talked about it and we said, okay, the best thing to do is to let everybody fulfill their commitments because I, I have commitments to the band that I've been playing in for the last uh, five years, the guess who? And it wasn't, I wasn't about to like drop, you know, tell him, hey, I'm out of here, guys. Good luck. You know, I've, I've never done that. Mm. You know, so I have commitments with him. And, and uh, Quiet Riot has commitments with Chuck Wright. And those, we felt that the best, that the, the only thing that we can do, really, there's a must that all those commitments must be fulfilled. So our agreement with everybody is fulfilled. You know, and so right now, I'm just basically making the transition, you know, embracing again the, the whole Quiet Riot consciousness, getting mm -hmm. back and playing the songs. And actually, it's, it's been wonderful because I got to tell you, to be able to go back to something that you did 40 years ago with a musician that I am today, I'm looking at the songs a little bit different yeah. as far as my own contributions. Of course, you know, it's not going to be something that is going to turn into completely something else. But there's certain note, note choices that I can improve on. But know, also spiritual, also spiritual, because I bet when you're playing, you, you, you're remembering the comrades, your, your partner, yes. too. And it gets emotional. Certain songs probably get real emotional up there while you're playing now and going and over it. At the core of the show is going to be the celebration of the legacy of our bandmates, mm -hmm. that it's our, our responsibility as the ones left behind that we must celebrate it's a must Fly away. Fly away. We'll meet again. it's a must it's a must so that is at the core of the show yeah very right on and uh Keep doing yeah. the good music you do. And everybody, all links for Rudy will be in the description below. Follow him. Check out his show. And um, you know what? We'll see you a little later, Rudy. Thank you very God much, bless my friend. You, God, God bless, bless you, my friend. I want to thank Rudy Sarzo for spending some time on Artist Rewind. And check out more stories with Rudy. All links will be in the description. And you can follow him. And also, please, join our Patreon for unlimited VIP all access pass that it's going to kind of take you to unlock unedited content that you might not have seen or you want more of because hey you want more Dika it's all in Patreon and your support helps keep this channel alive and 
to bring more stories of good rock and roll and keep the music alive. And uh, it's only rock and roll, people. And we like it. Until then, I will see you next Saturday, 8 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And check out that playlist. Unlock some other old shows that maybe you missed. And check out our vinyl challenge game shows with all the contestants. All righty. It's a big family of rock and roll love. Until then, everybody, we will see you later. Adika loves you. I'm out of here, kids. God bless you all. Mwah. Bam! You can't get rid of me that quick, can you? All right, and please, 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 you might see something pop up over there, over there. If it's not there, it's going to be there or maybe there. Oh, look what just popped up over here. Click on it, share it, and tell people this is the action, this is the place, this is the love. I'll see you all later. Thank you very much for spending your time with me. Mwah.